Hi, I am Lena Rowald. And I'm Carlton Coffrin. And in this video on convex relaxations in power system optimization, we're going to give a very brief overview of computational hardness uh, with the idea of motivating why we're so interested in convex relaxations of power system optimization problems. Now, it's important to note that computational complexity is a very technical topic with a lot of details in it. And in this talk, I'm really going to focus on giving you a high-level intuition without going into a lot of the details. And some of what I say could maybe be a little bit misleading or confusing. But if you're interested in computational complexity, I would highly recommend this textbook, which I enjoyed a lot when I was an undergrad. For those of you who are computer scientists, a lot of this will be review, but for power and the power engineers among you, you may have never have heard of these topics before. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so let's start with what is computational hardness or computational complexity. The basic idea is that if you have a problem um, with a number of input elements, like n input elements, you want to know how many computational steps are required uh, for, to compute a worst case input. So it's a bit of an adversarial problem. We're not talking about you know, what is the best case for you. We're talking about if someone picked the absolute worst case for you, uh, how long would it take you to compute that? So here, just to, you have like an, a problem, and then you have an input, and then you want to know how many computational steps are required to get the output. Correct. Okay. And it's really about uh, how does it scale as n increases, right? For some fixed value, it's kind of a constant amount of computation, but you want to understand the functional trend. So here's an, a more concrete example to try to give you some intuition for this. Say that you give me a list of items and you want to sort them in ascending order. If you give me n items, there exists algorithms which require n log n steps to get them all sorted in the ascending order. And you can even prove that if all you can do is compare two items uh, and to know which one is greater than the other, um, n log n is the minimum number of steps you can compute. It's impossible to design an algorithm which does it with less steps than this. So uh, given this kind of functional formalism for how long it takes to compute things, different complexity classes have been developed. So one of the biggest ones is called polynomial time, or p. And these are widely accepted to be what we would say fast to solve. So these take uh, a polynomial function uh, in the input. And then there are problems, another popular class is the non-deterministic polynomial time, which is called NP, uh, which generally we would say are slow to solve or impractical to solve because the runtime is usually exponential um, in the input. So, I mean, here you are talking about the worst case inputs. So what about kind of the typical inputs or the average inputs? Um, will it still be really slow to solve an NP-hard problem? Or? So you can always get a very convenient input that would solve very fast. It depends a lot on your algorithm. There have been new ideas put forward like um, average case complexity or parameterized complexity where you have different uh, from parameters based on your input data and the algorithm is growing in different ways based on those different parameters. But to the best of my knowledge, um, none of those particular complexity ideas have been brought to bear in power systems um, optimization analyses. So one of the biggest questions in computer science is whether this class of polynomial time problems is the same uh, in kind of worst case complexity as the non-deterministic polynomial time class, or if they're different. So you can see these two kind of Venn diagrams for where different problems might lie. And there's this big question, is the set of NP complete problems equal to the set of P problems in terms of this computational complexity, or are they fundamentally different? And it's kind of shocking that computer science hasn't been able to answer this question yet. It seems very fundamental, but it's, uh, it's a, a lot of people are working on it, and it's a very hard problem to answer this question. So, so hang on. So to, for this kind of this big question, what it would mean to show whether, like, for example, it was possible to show that P equals NP, would that mean that there is always an easy algorithm available to solve the NP-hard problem? 
it definitely could mean that. If someone came along and said, here's my magic trick, every NP complete problem can be solved in N cubed time, then it would totally change the world. Like all sorts of hard problems around in lots of different sectors would be instantly solved very efficiently. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's true if P is equal to NP. Someone could come along with a proof that says there always exists a polynomial time algorithm with N to the hundredth power. Now, that is a polynomial function, but n to the hundred is just so brutal that uh, for any reasonable size problem, you wouldn't be able to solve it practically, and we would be in the same situation we are now. So um, I would say the status quo among computer scientists is just to assume that the class of problems p is not equal to the class of np problems, and we move on just kind of assuming this is the way the computation works. So. Why did I tell you all about that? Why do we care about this for optimization and power systems? Well, there are classes of optimization problems which we can call the easy optimization problems. And that means that there exist solution algorithms which are in this polynomial time class, and you can kind of solve those problems easily. Typically, these optimization problems have continuous variables and convex constraints. So this is why convexity gets very exciting. There are also hard problems, optimization problems, which are known to be in this NP class of, of problems. And those can be ones with continuous variables but non-convex constraints. They can also be mostly any problem with discrete variables is usually hard uh, to solve. Now, there are some notable exceptions. So you could look at something like computing the shortest path in a graph or computing the minimum spanning tree of a graph. Those are cases that have really weird non-convex constraints and really weird discrete variables, but they actually are easy to solve. So it's really a case-by-case -case basis. You need to understand your problem and what algorithms exist for your problem. Okay, and so just to understand this better, so if I have a a problem with continuous variables, which has convex constraints, I know that I am in P and I should be able to find an efficient solution algorithm. Yes. Whereas if I have a problem which has continuous variables, but non-convex constraints, I may or may not have an efficient solution algorithm. Correct. So it could be that I am still in P, but it could also be that it is an NP hard problem. Correct. Okay. So. Let's look at this AC optimal power flow problem and ask the question, well, is it a hard problem or is it an easy problem? Is it in this P class or is it in this NP class? So to start to understand this, we can focus in on this particular constraint, which captures the engineering requirement of having the voltage magnitudes within some bounds. So what I'm showing you here is taking that voltage magnitude constraint and expanding it out into real numbers. So what we have is the real component of the voltage I, the, re the imaginary volt uh, component of the voltage I, and we're squaring both of them because we're taking the absolute square of that complex number. And then we have the lower bound and upper bound um, data that comes from the problem specification. If we graph this particular um, equation, these inequalities on a 2D plane, what you're gonna see is a picture like this. So it's basically defining a donut where the less than or equal to constraint is the bigger circle and the greater than or equal to constraint is the smaller circle. So what this means is that to be for this constraint to be feasible, I want to be in this blue region. Correct. Right? Okay. Now, when you look at that in a little bit more detail, you see that this lower bound constraint is a non-convex constraint because it's basically saying I'm outside of the inner circle. Okay. Um, so it kind of makes a hole in the feasible correct. space of this constraint. Correct. And this should be raising warning bells that you could be in the class of hard problems. And the reason for that is when you look at continuous, nonlinear, non-convex functions, you can model very complicated and very challenging stuff. So a canonical example is this function, you know, x times x minus 1 equals 0. The only feasible solutions to this equality constraint is when x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 1. And you could imagine that you can use this kind of like discrete structure to encode all sorts of hard uh, problems. So ACOPF might be a hard problem, it might be an easy problem, but you need to do a proof either way to kind of claim that it's hard or it's easy. It's really not obvious when you're at this stage in the game. 
So the good news is a number of really smart people have done a significant amount of work to show cases when the ACOPF problem is hard. So um, one of these papers talks about if you're just in a tree network and all you're trying to decide is does there exist a solution to this particular AC optimal power flow problem in uh, a tree network, then it's NP hard to decide that. There's other papers which look at, say, uh, mesh networks and show that there's a strong MP-hardness within those uh, particular networks, uh, which strengthens the proof a little bit more. So um, I guess the good news is that people have already kind of figured out, yeah, ACOPF is in this hard class, um, but uh, the bad news is we have to deal with that for all of our problems that uh, we want to solve. So what are the consequences of those two theoretical results? Um, the first one is that this ACOF OPF problem is a hard problem. You should generally assume it's a hard problem. Now, what those results really show is that for the worst case adversarial input, the solving the system of equations you're seeing on the right here is hard to do. Now, that doesn't mean that for some special sets, subsets of those inputs, it would be easy. So for example, maybe realistic data has a certain structure which is, makes this problem magically easy. Uh, another thing that that does not show is that for your favorite variant of this problem, when you go in and you add a new constraint or you delete one of these constraints or modify one of these constraints, that it still remains a hard problem. Now, if you go into those papers and you read them in detail and understand how they work, you'll develop some intuition if the variant you're making to the problem is going to make it easier or harder. But in any case, you really need to... Um, if you're going to make a claim that your this problem is easy or hard, you need to uh, show it, uh, prove it. So, I think it's important to emphasize that if you claim that your method uh, can solve this ACO we have problem in polynomial time, so say with a convex relaxation. Um, for any possible input, it's a kind of analogous to claiming that the p set of problems is equal to the np problems through this chain of results. Okay, so just here for a moment. So if I had a convex relaxation to the ACOPF, which without any additional assumptions on, yeah, all this, this it was really just looking at this problem, hmm. and I was able to claim I have a convex relaxation, and it would always be able to solve this problem to optimality, then I would essentially be claiming that P equals that P. Um, it's, the, that's a good first approximation. It, it can be much more subtle than that. So for example, uh, let's say you're building a convex relaxation, but the size of the relaxation is exponential in the uh, input to the power pro flow problem, then actually, your convex relaxation may always give you the right solution, but your the algorithm's runtime is growing exponentially with the um, the size of your relaxation. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very subtle thing, and you have to be extremely careful um, when you're going to make claims of this kind. Okay. I mean, I would recommend if you're going to make such a claim to get uh, a proper computer science complexity theorist on your team and make sure that they really sign off on it because it would be a very significant result. Now, just to give you the magnitude of what it means to say something like p is equal to np, you would be instantly famous, you would go down in the history books, there's a million dollar prize out there for, for solving this problem, and uh, you'd get the Turing Award, which is like the biggest prize in computer science. So it's, um, I would say, it seems quite unlikely that this result would come through the power systems kind of research avenue, but... Uh, it would be really cool if it did. <laughs> it would be, it would be, but proceed with caution. <laughs> uh, so now all that said, I don't want to discourage uh, the use of convexity for solving problems in practical purposes. So um, one thing that's worth noting is that what we've seen in practice is that it's very easy to find high quality solutions to ACOPF on realistic data sets for the toy academic problem that we've been discussing in this uh, lecture series. And a plausible explanation for that is that the data in realistic problems has some structure which this worst case theory does not capture and we, um, we're just kind of missing it because it's hard to analyze um, how complex a problem is when it depends a lot on the input data. 
Okay, so what you're saying is that the realistic type of input data might actually make it easy. Yes, e definitely it might make it much easier than these worst case bounds that have been uh, shown in the literature. Um, and I would say that it's fairly easy to observe that empirically. You can run it on hundreds of test cases and kind of show, hey, look, it's easy to get a high quality solution. Um, but proving it for you know some particular class of general inputs is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. So what some people have been doing to try to address this issue is that they've proposed variants of the ACOPF problem that we've been talking about the, in these lectures. So for example, if you ha can do arbitrary consumption of power at nodes in the network, and you're looking at radial or tree networks, and your objective function is kind of minimizing uh, active power, then there are some very nice results that say a convex relaxation will always give you the globally optimal solution and it'll be AC feasible. There's a similar result uh, for mesh networks where you also have phase shifting and I've referenced two papers which you can go and read the details of those proofs, but um, the basic idea here is that if you have a particular problem you're trying to solve and it, you can modify the problem formulation in such a way, um, potentially you could turn this otherwise hard problem into an easy problem and have a very practical algorithm. So now also, I mean, for some optimal power flow problems, uh, which do not satisfy those assumptions and do not have those variants that but are maybe more practical, where you, for example, have fixed power consumptions. Some of those relaxations have all also been shown to work very well. Correct. Right? So, or for many, many realistic problems. Mm -hmm. So is that also, that is also linked to this, the idea that you are able to find high quality solutions to the ACO OPF on realistic data sets. That is also linked to the fact that Convex relaxations that have been proposed in literature often provide good results. I, yes, I think all of these are connected concepts. So if you design, say, a polynomial time algorithm for solving ACOPF, and, uh, and you observe on all, you can't prove it that it's gonna, always going to work, but you observe on all real data sets it always works, that is a very compelling evidence. It's not a proof. But it's, it's maybe a good hint that you should get a hardcore theory person on board and like really study if there's a structural property you can prove analytically. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I would, I would just mention that this whole idea of understanding the computational hardness of ACOPF and power system optimization in general is a very active area of research. So, um, you know, look to the most recent literature. There's probably lots of interesting results that we haven't discussed here. Okay, so then I should maybe try and say what I am taking from this um, as the power systems person in the room. Um, so to recap, um, what Carlton has told us here is that there are these different classes of problems and that actually the AC optimal power flow is really hard to compute in general. So you could find a really bad set of inputs that would make this problem really hard. And what is sort of the takeaway f for us as power engineers is that when we are working on this, or I mean, uh, really, really for anyone, is that we cannot really assume that the AC optimization problems are easy or hard without providing analytical proofs or really very extensive computational experiments. Because there might exist cases where th they are hard or they are easy. Okay, so then getting to what is coming next here, we are going to look at a review of established solution methods for AC optimal power flows. So essentially, how do you, how do we kind of traditionally solve these nonlinear optimization problems with um, non-convex constraints? Um, and then we are going to provide uh, an intuition for how it is possible to convexify the AC optimal power flow. And you know, when if we were able to convexify this AC optimal power flow, then we should be able to get back into this kind of easy class of problem, isn't it? Correct. Then that's the main motivation to to you want convexity because then you can somehow use this convexity for fast outcomes. Great.